Hi, this is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. And this will be part 316 in our series. Our title today is Changes in the Heavens. Scripture teaches the creation is currently awaiting its deliverance. Mm -hmm. Turn to Romans 8. Verse 21. Mr. Jones, let me ask a question. Sure. The creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God in order to liberate it. Now, the creation, mm -hmm. angels, life forms, trees, flowers, rocks, mm -hmm. everything is cognizant of there is a supreme being and he promises to liberate them from the subjectivity they're currently in. Mm -hmm. Except for the humans, they refuse to look into this. And that's the prime directive of the Father, is to get the humans to a place where they can fill in in very high positions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What's my question? Waiting to find out. Just elaborating on it. It's, it's astonishing mm -hmm. that the complete opposite has happened to where humans believe that they made themselves. Mm -hmm. They created themselves. No, what's, see, the humans are supposed to be satiate beings, abilities to do this, that, and the other. The flowers know so more than the humans. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, 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 that's a mystery. That's, right. well, that's why Jesus says, you know, if you, they, if you don't praise me, even the rocks will cry out right. and praise me. Right. And that, that's all humans withhold praise. I mean, it's like you said, everything in creation worships and praises God. Only humans choose to withhold praise from the Almighty, which is mm. crazy. That's where the word layman comes from. Layman? Layman. <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> layman, right? What you have here, basically, the intonation is that the creation realizes it does not, it's not able to function to the degree in which it was designed to function. It's inhibited. It is limited. And in this limitation, no matter how hard the creation tries, it cannot operate in the way it was designed to operate. So it's in a state of misery. And in this state, it understands, because the Father has inculcated it with the understanding that there will come a time in which it will be enabled to function to its fullness. That's why you read, uh, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah, it says, when the liberation takes place, even the trees will clap their hands, because they will be able, for the first time, to operate the way they were designed to operate. And having said that, <clears throat> we said that the creation shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, Romans 8, 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So the creation knows that it's going to be delivered. It also knows who is going to be its deliverer. Having said that, Scripture teaches a certain region of the heavens within the creation holds the human race and the creation in captivity through the influence of of fallen principalities that inhabit within its regions. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 12. This is the term. Mm -hmm. 
Can you give us some indications to the size of this region in comparison to the totality of the second region? Well, we know that the, uh, the unmistakable inference is that it's vast. Okay. It's huge. <clears throat> but uh, so are all the heavens and the, uh, the constitution of the creation. But this region is vast enough in which it engulfs the whole human race. It engulfs uh, basically, I would say, the majority of the uh, secondary creation in, under its influence. So it's what you would describe as the universe? Yes. Most of the universe, in other words, is that region? Yes. Okay, so we know there's going to be new heavens and new earth. Yes. Are how many of the heavens, the old heavens, are going to pass away? All of them. All of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the entire region that you're referring to? No. Because the, uh, the heavens are going to be conquered incrementally okay. through different designs that the Father has already manifest in his master plan. What we're looking at here is one region which is going to experience liberation. So that region where the second strings are right now, which will become the wilderness, is a spiritual region or a physical region? Spiritual. Okay, now that makes sense to me then. Okay. Ephesians the sixth chapter, verse twelve, speaks about this region. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word places there is in italics, so it's talking about, actually the word here is eparanios, but it's not referring to the eparanios in which the Father exists. So why? Yes? All of the heavens that are going to disappear, they're inhabited. Yes. Are the inhabitants going to disappear too? Yes. Mm. Yes. Just like the earth. But if they're, if they're right, well, they're not righteous, are they? No. Which is why they disappear. Okay. Quickly coming back to the uh, use of the word Eperanus for an area which is not the Eperanus which the Father inhabits. Mm -hmm. Why are we hearing an Eperanus? which is undetermined. We, we, we can't you know, conceive of it, but yet the Father does not reside, reside there. Well, the word Eperanios basically gives you a um, con connotation that it's a high, high region in which exalted beings exist. So it could be used for the high area inside the primal creation. Yes. Is what definitely. you're saying. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Just like the word heavens. Heavens is multitudinous. Are there um, created angels in that Ephraimus, which is not the Ephraimus which the Father inhabits? Yep. We just read about it. So then, if, the, if these are in that Ephraimus area, then the YHVH locale, you know, the, the, the domains of YHVH, we know that some in the second and some in the primary, is that part of the Ephraimus, or is it, it can't be above that, so it has to be below that. The Eperanios that this is referring to deals with the lower region that dominates the human race and the physical universe. So it's the second dream of the question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Eperanios. Yes. Not, you can't describe it. You can say it. Thank you for digging that out. Now, hmm. there are Exalted beings in Epiranos? In this particular Epiranos, they're fallen. But it's being used to give an understanding that these are high fallen beings. Okay, wait a minute. You just now said that there's a region in Epiranos that's fallen. The Epiranos is fallen. We just read it. <clears throat> Principalities, thrones, dominions, in heavenly places. The word heavenly is the perennials. I think we need to 
recognize that the areas we're talking about, in other words, the physical location we're talking about, are beyond human comprehension. And that's the reason why the word epidemics is, is being used. Not because it's the epidemics where the father resides, just that it's beyond. It's giving you a distinction in this creation where this region lies. It's a high region right. in the secondary right. creation in which highly exalted beings but fallen beings right. operate to dominate all the lower regions. Okay. So we could say that the term Epiranios, not the location we understand as Epiranios, but the term Epiranios is anything beyond, below the YHVH regions of the secondary region. Now the YHVH regions are above this in the secondary, in the right. secondary and that's region. why I said below the white, because yes. this is where these these uh, uh, principalities are found. So it has exactly. to be below the white VH regions, but still in the secondary. They are below the white VH regions because they cover where we are on the earth. That's what I'm saying. Directly influencing, keeping this region in captivity and bondage. Right. So in the future, when you say Epiranus, how do we know which we're talking about? Context of scripture. Yes. So I think he just you know, brought out my question. Mm -hmm. There's more than one Ekaranios. Yes. And are there levels in Ekaranios? Yes. Except for where the Father is. Right. Yes. And He's there, the only inhabitant. Gotcha. And there are no levels in that one. Yes. Right. So when you taught us only last week, you asked exactly that question on um, uh, Sunday or Friday, one of the two. When you, when you, would, when you said, no, there are no levels. You agree with it that there were not any levels in Epirenius. Mm -hmm. You were referring to that which is outside of the creation. Yes. Right? So, coming back to the point, in future when we discuss Epirenius, how do we know which you're going to talk about unless you describe everything we've said in the past 17 years? Well, uh, what I'll try to do is to give you an understanding of who is indwelling the Epirenius. Perfect. Perfect. Because this, this Epirenius is a part of the creation and is giving us an understanding of the activities that are taking place in this Iperanios. The Iperanios that the Father dwells in, there's only one statement about that, in that it has no name, will ever have, will ever forever be nameless because it cannot be defined. Because the Father's presence can't be defined. So we're encountering nuances, which are <coughs> this. This is similar to me hearing that this angel is actually God. <laughs> and I've got to look at him very well. Every lesson we're receiving now is changing our, our comprehension. It's, it's consistently, new. consistently, yes. Because the, this revelation is giving us an understanding that we can't define it from a human perspective, right. human terms. Right. It keeps changing as we gain greater understanding of it. Mm. And that's the way the Father designs it. You can't receive it in one fell swoop because the human mind can't comprehend it in one fell swoop. It has to be comprehended in stages of mature comprehension. So when we get gathered, the teachers will have more understanding. They won't know as they're known yet, but will they have further knowledge of the perennials? Most definitely. They will have the, but at that point, they'll have the fullness. Well, you mean when, at the gathering? At, at the elevation. Yes. If, if they're teaching everybody, at that point, they're able to, to draw from the Holy Spirit. They have access to the entire creation visible and invisible. They do not have access to the Piranios. That's the only distinction. They have to be glorified to enter into that yeah, exalted state. But well, let's go on. <clears throat> Principle. Scripture teaches these fallen beings in the Piranios were told that they would fall in a time of judgment. Psalms 
I have said, your gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So he say, he's making a definite statement. These are not humans. That they are exalted principalities, sons of God, angelic beings, who are responsible for the condition of the human race and the condition of the creation that they have been given authority over but misused their authority. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So basically he's talking about a judgment that's going to come on unto them like it does to humans. And they're going to experience the same thing that humans experience. And then after they experience that, they're going to fall, they fall. They're going to be cast down from their positions and go into a state of uh, total imprisonment. Now, Scripture teaches, when the Lord returns to gather his people, he will deal with these Luciferians by taking away their power and casting them down to the torment regions of earth. Luke 21, 25 to 27. Thank you for showing up. Mm. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. It just makes a big difference when thank there's you. more. Thank you. Yes. God bless you guys for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Or thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Luke 21, 25. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So what's happening here is that the, uh, the creation is going to suddenly enter into convulsions that are going to literally cause the heavens and the earth to experience unprecedented upheavals. Why? Because Elohim is getting directly involved in entering into the creation. So, at the beginning of Sorrows, just before this, the second string is the Ephesians 6.12 that we just read. Here, the, um, the judgment being shouted out by Halloween, the same way that every other being does. What makes them think, upon hearing the judgment, that their goose will not be cooked. What I'm asking is, do they understand upon hearing it, it's all over for them? No. They think that their stuff will continue. Because it's not directed directly at them at that time. Mm. But it's, it's not directed at all the inhabitants of the earth. That's what Jeremiah says, the first section. He's going to deal with the earth. Things are going to take place. A period of time is going to transpire and he's going to deal with them. In, in Gemini 25, 26, it states three groups. The first group is not human. The first group are the kings of the north and the south, which are the second streams that we're talking They about. are going into states of crisis okay. and um, a, a basic intimidation, but they haven't fallen. Okay, so it takes them a longer period of time. Okay. So they believe then, upon hearing the judgment that their, their actuality will continue exactly as it is yep. until this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So the heavens go into convulsion. That's when the judgment's fallen on these guys. They're going to be drained of their power and then they're going to be shaken out of the dominions brought down to the earth gathered to the torment regions. 
in that order. That's what Psalms 82 says. You shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. That's exactly what happened during the Luciferian revolt. So this will liberate the heavens. At least that vast region of the heavens. Turn to Psalms 50, verse 5 to 6. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Keep your finger in Psalms 50. We're not going to go to verse 6 yet. I want you to go to Luke 17. Drop down to verse 34, 35, 36. I tell you in that night, there shall be two in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be in the field, the one taken, the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? He said unto them, Whithersoever the body is, Soma, the body of Christ, thither will the eagles be gathered together. The noble birds, those that are going to be the authorities over those of the Soma. Well, where are they? initially taken because the inference here is that they're not directly taken to the body of Christ it says wherever the body of Christ is there will the eagles be gathered together at some point well they're originally initially taken to the bema seat of Christ to receive their re inheritance their rewards but then, they, then they go to yes well I was about to say those who become angels go from the to the position over the churches is, is a, a yes. understanding to me. Yes. Yes. Now, go back to Psalms 50. Hang on a second. I'm not, for some reason, I feel like I, I didn't catch something here. Okay. These noble birds. Mm -hmm. Who are they? You. Okay. Are, why is it where the eagles are gathered is where they are at? No, it says where the body okay. is. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay, so now the grouping of the different members that comprise the body. Mm -hmm. Wherever there are body, the body represented, the noble bird is going to be taken there. Not directly. He's directly going to be taken to the beamer seat to receive his reward. You're laying in bed. All of a sudden, the Lord descends. Gather my faithful around me. and made a covenant with me with sacrifice. You're taken. Where are you taken? To the Lord. You receive your position. 
Then, depending upon if you are an angel, if you are a prophet, if you are an apostle, if you're an angel, you're going to go directly to the heavens. If you're still on earth, you're going to go to where the Soma is to take your position. Now, notice what it says in verse 6 of Psalms 50. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. What does this mean? It means it's creation, which is being liberated, is beginning to glorify and praise the Lord for its deliverance. Should we understand that that same creation also glorifies the sons of God for their deliverance, since they're the ones who will be doing the deliverance? Yes, but in context to who they are representing. So God gets all the glory. Right. Well, anyway, yes. But he, he, every, essentially everywhere he goes, the brethren go. Yes, but it's in context. In other words, it's like World War II. The American army goes in and they liberate Paris. <laughs> And everybody's cheering. You see the tanks going down the Champs de Lys, and you see all in there just just hugging all the Americans, and they're they're glad to see them. But it's the country that's getting the glory in that context. The country, the USA. Yes. Now, turn to Psalms. Eighty-nine, verse two. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. It's talking about they're going to see that he's true to his promises. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does it say the very heavens? idea it's referring to the liberated Eperanios where these guys have been cast down the angels are going to take that all over you're referring to the wilderness regions but what will become the wilderness regions well the wilderness regions are, I don't believe are going to be that part they're going to be the heavens but other regions of the heavens that haven't yet been liberated. But the regions, what we read about in, in Luke 21, where the principalities, the powers of heaven have been shaken out of them, are going to be the first ones to be liberated. They're going to be the headquarters for those that have received their inheritance because the human race and the regions of the creation now, the inhabitants that have been liberated in here need to be ministered to. Okay, so that becomes the headquarters of the Pesachi And it's going to be the start of the liberation of the creation by the sons of God. Doesn't that put these headquarters that you're referring to below the YHVA regions of the second world? Yes. So for how long will that continue? Because this is, we're reading about regime change. Yes. So at some point, the y 38 regions would have to become subservient to the abodes of the Pesachi. Remember, this is all progressive. Okay. The Prototokis have received authority over all his goods. Okay. To do what? To give them the truth of God and his ways. They haven't been glorified yet. Okay. Okay. So you don't have the fullness of regime change. You okay. have the first increment. 
<laughs> stage of it. So why yeah. the Ocean has the presence of mind, I would <coughs> mm -hmm. that he isn't inconvenienced by the progression of God's master plan. <laughs> Not at all. The thing with it is, is, see, Mr. Jones, mm -hmm. it's a, we're talking about his ultimate relocation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a demotion. Yes. So, uh, but when we take a look at the overall picture, the father is in, the father's calling the shots here. Why does VH get any say so in the matter? The son has been given authority by the father to implement the father's master plan, which is centered around what? Sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, what is YHVH going to be doing in all this? Turn to Deuteronomy 32nd chapter. Remember, the Lord has descended to gather, to judge, <coughs> and to distribute to the inheritors their inheritance. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. I'm just trying to get blessed. Definitely getting blessed. Verse 8. Yes. When the Most High, Elion, divided to the nations their inheritance. This is the gathering. When he separated the sons of Adam, this are the elders, all those that come out of the human race that are now positioned in the communities that constitute the churches on a global scale. You see the entrance of YHVH in the picture. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So now YHVH gets his assignment. His assignment has been reduced from the creation, supervision, that's now taken over by Elohim. His total focus now is restoration of Israel, the 12 tribes, reestablishing the Mosaic society, preparing them as best he can for the things that are gonna come on them in the tribulation period. For the Lord's portion, this is my wife's VH, is his people, Jacob, is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eyes. And so now this is the fullness of his efforts. Everything's focused on restoration of the tribes of Israel. This shift, now there's no competition. The sons of God have been given their authority. They're the teachers, the instructors of all the master's goods in the heavens and on the earth. So if you understand that regime change, meaning the prophetic sons take over all things, that begins at the end of the gathering with the elevation. Yes. And that process continues through until the rapture. Yes. And at that point, YHVH recognizes that he is, he is subservient to the service. Yes. At the point of the rapture or the point of the... Point of the gathering. The gathering. When, when the teachers come into their authority, that initiates... The change. The, 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 it's like John says, he must increase, I must decrease. Yes. YHVH is decreasing. Right. So 
at the point of the elevation of the angels in the start of the churches, should we understand that Y3H begins taking orders? Well, he's taking orders from the Lord, not from the Prototokos teachers. Okay. It's the Lord that's telling him, okay, now you take over Israel. It's the Lord that's telling the Prototokos teachers, you're assigned over the churches, you do this. It's the Lord that's distributing the inheritance to everybody. He's the sole authority at this point. So the instructions from the Prototokos are not taken until the, the, uh, the rapture? Yes. Okay. They have to be glorified to enter into the fullness of sonship. Before white free can rec will recognize that. Right? Because that's what he's been told to do. Yes. That then is the point at which the young master, I'm using the young master in the aristocratic family as the example, has, has become into his own. He's now age 21. He takes over the full, the, the inheritance in its fullness. Mm -hmm. And all of the servants who were previously his tutors now recognize him as the master. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They did that with the kings. Yeah. Well, they've done that forever, yes. It still continues in, in, the, in Europe. Yes. Yes. Now, <clears throat> we read, Scripture indicates the Prototokos teachers will take over the heavens from the evil Luciferians they're cast down who were cast out. From there, they, the Prototokos teachers, will oversee the churches and instruct the races in the heavens, the purposes of God, and those of earth. In other words, the scripture tells us the gathering is a connection of all things in Christ in heaven and in earth. They all then come under the instruction and authority of the Prototokos teachers. So what we find here is the initiation, the initial stage of authority transfer. The first group that comes under the authority from the sun will be the Prototokos teachers. And the apostles and prophets of uh, the churches. Turn to Jeremiah 23. Verse 3 and 4. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. So this is the gathering out from the current Adamic world system that will collapse to the places where Elohim will position them so that they can receive the gospel. They can become prepared for the things that are coming on the world. They can become conversant with the Father's master plan. Then, verse 4, And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, and nor be dismayed, Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord, which is what's taking place now. Christians are in a state of disarray. They don't know what they believe in. They're not being given an understanding of the principles of Christianity. They're not being prepared for anything. They have no goal. They have no vision. They have no understanding. They are the laughing stock of all the other religions. Yes. What is the they won't be lacking mentioned? 
it means that they will be prepared to deal with all circumstances. In the scripture that says, study to show yourself approved, the workmen, <clears throat> basically in which you, you will not be found having any lack of comprehension of what you believe in. Um, today it's just the opposite. Why? Because of the Luciferian influence, because of the Terran influence, and because of the, the lack of the will of the individual to pursue on his own. People, for some reason, what we're talking about now is what we're about to enter into. Every day, things get more and more hectic. Things get more and more fragmented. We're entering into a period of convulsions. We're entering, entering into a period where the current system that we know is going to break down in all its aspects. We're going to reach a stage where everybody has to make a decision. Where do they stand? Are we going to be willing to leave this reality that really is not a reality and embrace God's reality? Or are we going to hold on to the pseudo-reality and go down with it? If we choose to pursue these principles that we're discussing, when the chaos overwhelms the totality of society, then we will be the bulwarks in which people will gravitate to because their belief system is going to fail them. They're not going to find anything to trust in except another Luciferian line. But if there's a Christian who has the truth and he's been tested and they understand that he has the truth and they respect what he has to say and believe what he has to say, you'll be responsible for taking a lot of people from the darkness into the light. It starts here in this life and it progresses into the heavens. I'm going to give you an example of that. We said Luke 21, that those responsible for the human race's bondage are going to be kicked out, displaced, and imprisoned, and those who have graduated, overcome the conditions here, are going to be positioned in the same heavens to oversee all the intelligences that formerly were under the bondage of these fallen principalities. When that happens, you're going to be given the authority <clears throat> to influence not only those of the human race, but those of the other races in addition. You are going to be a repository of truth to the creation. Turn to Daniel, the eighth chapter. Verse 13 to 16. We said in a prior lesson, you're going to have the authority to step into the past, present, and future because you can become at one with God who spans past, present, and future. As a representative of God, as a teacher of God, as a conveyor of the truth of God, you will be an emissary to those in the past, those in the present, those in the future, those of the earth, those of the heavens. You see an example here in Daniel. Daniel Eighth chapter, verse 13, Daniel's given a vision. In his vision, he sees heaven and he sees the saints 
instructing and being instructed in the eternal truths of the things of God. Verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? So what Daniel overhears is the curtain opens up. There is no longer any separation between the past and the things that are taking place in eternity. Daniel is connected and he hears a conversation taking place with the Prototokos teachers pertaining to a time period that will take place on earth in the future. Now, Daniel's presence is noted by this group that is engaged in conversation because we see in the next passage of scripture that the person that's speaking, the saint, verse 14, he, the saint that was speaking, said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I want you to take note of this. Daniel is being incorporated from a time of thousands of years in the past to a conversation taking place outside of the time domain in eternity between two participants that are in the heavens, or not even on earth. So, let me just quickly clarify. So, we're understanding verse 14 that the Protestant who is answering is not answering the other Protestant, he's answering Daniel. Yes. He's speaking directly to Daniel, as if Daniel asked a question himself. Yes, exactly. Because he understands the significance of Daniel needing to understand or be given an answer because it is going to deal with the prototokis development in the coming years. An example of the greatness of the authority that God is going to impart to his sons. You will be able to transit, transit past, present, and future in dialogue with those in all of the elements that are pertaining, that need to be pertained to God's master plan. Yes? Is in this conversation that we're having right now, the 70 weeks, does that come in? That's part of it, yes. Okay. Well, I wanted you to explain to, to Dara about God taking a week of time and allowing it progress and then reintroduces that week of time in during our time. So he's literally removed time and is going to release it during our time. And it's 69 weeks, but there's, there's a prophecy of 70 weeks. So he's 69 weeks have gone forward, but there's one week left and it's week of years. Yes, and in that seventh week, it talks about everything is going to be fulfilled. And people think that the tribulation period is only going to be one week, seven years. That's not what the scripture says. The tribulation period is going to be within a generation, which is 40 years. So but that's, it, hmm. that's not what we're referring to here in verse 17. No, I'm addressing his comment, though. It will constitute the end of a... 40 year period and some all the things that need to be restored in that seven year period but we're going to do that in a different lesson I just wanted to address this comment what we find here is a principle and that principle is the ability to be transcendental no limitations no constrictions to the Son of God that perseveres to maintain, to obtain this position. Now notice what he goes on to say. Verse 15, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision 
and sought for the meaning, then behold, it stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So we see another aspect of the Prototokos teacher. There is a group having a conversation in the heavens that open a passageway to the past, dialogue with somebody who is resident in the past. And then we see the aspect that the teacher, who is an Adam, has taught residents of the heavens who are angelic because the man, Ish, that's being referred to, that's dispatched to give Daniel the answer to his question, is not a human, he is an angel, an ascended being that has sat under the teaching of the saint. Been given the whole understanding of what needs to be received pertaining to the end of the age of the human race's dispensation. He gives this to Daniel so Daniel can pen it and seal it for the time in which the human race is going to need it at the time that it will be open for them. Yes? Why was it done that way? Why didn't he just hand it to Daniel himself instead of involving Gabriel? Because he's exerting his authority. He's dispatching somebody that's under his authority to do what that person has been assigned to do. Remember, the church, apostles, prophets, devoting themselves to revelation. Well, the Gratians and the um, <coughs> uh, Hebrews are having a dispute about they need to be ministered to, assign people to do that. We aren't going to take our time waiting on tables to do what God's called us to do. We're going to assign other people to do it. Same principle. When you're in authority, God doesn't want you to deviate one iota from what you have been called to do. He, he has dispatched, dispensed others to take that position. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Appropriate people to serve tables. <laughs> yes. Appropriate. Yeah, appropriate people, yes. Turn to Daniel 7, 13 to 16. I think I remember you saying that the Lord taught Gabriel and Michael the revelation that they needed to know. And it wasn't the Protodicus. Is that correct? No. Okay, we don't get that point. No. So it was the Protodicus who taught Gabriel and Michael what they needed to know. Yes. Okay. And they passed it on to the prophets. Okay. You read the book of Zechariah, there's a conversation between an angel who's trying to get information from the Lord, and the Lord gives him a minimal amount of information, but you can see that he is restricting what the angel is going to receive because it's not for him to know. It's Prototokos, destiny to, to receive and to give to the angelic hierarchy. He's going to be teaching YHVH. Praise the Lord. Daniel 7, starting in verse 13. I saw... Hmm? I saw Daniel 7, 13? Yes. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Daniel is given a vision, and he's describing what he sees. Then there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all people and nations and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Daniel receives his vision, but he didn't understand what he was looking at. He didn't have a comprehension of the significance of it. I came near unto one of them that stood by. So the vision is not just given to Daniel. The vision is known by a number of individuals who comprehend what Daniel is struggling to understand. Again, you're looking at the prototokist teachers. Daniel is taken by vision into the heavenly realms and presented with a vision. Who gives him the vision? So Prototokus teachers. So those standing around with Daniel are other Prototokus teachers? Yes. Or created angels? No. These are saints. These are saints. Yeah, they're the originators of the vision. This is just like John being taken to heaven, being shown things. Why is there a group of saints? Why not just one saint doing it? A group of Prototokus instead of just <coughs> One. Because the Prototokos are a group. Is the implication that at least much of the time, in the same sense as a unified voice, mm -hmm. whenever the Prototokos are giving or instructing, they're doing it as a group. Yes. It's not, it's not necessarily one individual Prototokos, it's a whole group of them. Well, it's one, it's a hierarchy. It's one instructing others who are instructing others. So, those that were part of this vision that you're referring to, are others being instructed by the, the one who, who that's, that's what you're saying? Okay. Yes. So Once, it's, it's almost as if they're learning, if I could use that term, at yeah. the same time as Daniel is learning. Uh, yes. Hmm. Yes. The unique part of it is that when we saw Daniel 8, one saint is speaking to another saint about things taking place in the tribulation period. Hmm. That saint that he's speaking to receives the comprehension right. of it. Daniel comes up, and uh, there's no partition now between eternity and the past. Mm -hmm. So he's receiving the full the comprehension of what's going on. Yes? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay, so. mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The saints that we're talking about right now, have the fullness of the Holy Spirit? No. Okay, so they're not glorified yet? No. No, they just stepped into their inheritance and become teachers. <laughs> how, okay. much, how much more powerful, I'm mean, use that word to describe extra bits of inheritance, greater understanding, how much more powerful does one become between being an elevated angel over the churches and teaching the entire creation and being glorified? You can't compare it. Are you when you say you can't compare, are you talking about authority only? I'm talking about comprehension. I am too. Okay. Because when you get a when you get glorification, you've exited the creation. Of course, of course. No limitation. I'm being slow. <laughs> I'm being slow. <laughs> no, yeah. God, no problem. Anyway, verse 16. I came near unto one of them that stood by one of them. So you have you have several of them. Yes. And asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. <coughs> so you have an example here. You can't comprehend this from a human perspective. I keep saying that. You have to release linear thinking. Because as a inheritor of the position of teacher, you are crafted to exist beyond the linear domain. You are in a domain where you can transit past, present, and future, or remain in all three at the same time. Yes. Daniel is receiving from 
a higher Protodocus member. Mm -hmm. That Protodocus member is also speaking to, I'm going to use the term onlookers just so we can get an understanding of what we're talking about. So we've got Daniel, the other Protodocus who are at a lower level, and then the Protodocus who's instructed them all. Daniel, rather than speaking to the Protodocus who's instructed them all, is this true? He turns to one of the lower Protodocus and says, is what he's telling you, is, is what he's saying true? I find that curious. Why would he do that? Because, remember, everything is directed by the Spirit. Okay. He says, I came to one of those that stood by. So the inference is that the individual who is speaking and instructing is finished. Okay. So Daniel knows everybody is received. Right. It's like you coming into a class Late. at the end of the session, okay. and there's this teacher with his stick at the board, you know, and he's completed the last equation. Right. And people are packing up their books, and you go over to one guy and say, well, what was the lesson all about? Well, he can tell you. So what you have here is this, this is an exalted classroom session. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the amount that you can unpack from two lines. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I should give the glory to the two. Yeah, yeah, the Lord, not, yes. not you, Richard. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Turn to Daniel 9, we're going to end with verse 21 to 22. Okay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Stunning. This is consistent with Daniel. He is receiving revelation, revelation, revelation. Because he is a chosen vessel to be the custodian of revelation that will be needful when the time of the end takes place. And uh, he has it all stored in a book in which the prototokers will have access preparing them for the things just about to take place. Daniel 9, 21 to 22. And he's praying. He's praying for understanding. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and informed me, and talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. He says he was commanded to go and instruct Daniel. Who commanded him? What is the evening oblation? Uh, Daniel is a, is a priest, and he's talking about the time for of the prayers. priest's schedule. For, for these prayers? Uh, his duties. Okay. For Sacrifices at specific, specific okay. times. Daniel's in captivity, so basically he's going about doing what God's called him to do to minister to his people. But what you see here, you're looking at eternity, temporality, past, and things beyond time, all coming together. They're communicating as though there's no barrier. When we step into our calling, this is what you're going to be stepping into. Do you recall a time in your past when you were told that you were to be given skill and understanding? Yes, uh, in visions and dreams and things along that line, you, yeah. In a similar sense as, as Daniel here, yeah, because this is a, well, he actually physically turns up, doesn't he? Yes. Have you had that experience? Yes. Well, what we find here is this is a golden pearl of great price which we, if we pursue it, it will be ours. Amen. So, yeah, it was a part, it says at the beginning of thy supplications, 
the commandment came for it and says, and I come to show you. He said, who? <clears throat> who commanded Gabriel to teach? Who? The saint. The saint commanded Gabriel to teach Daniel. Daniel. So we're crossing, mixing time. Yes. Again, same thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But that was from now back to the past. Like exactly. we're, we're, there's no time continued. It's right. all interrupted right. now. You'll note in the chapter wow. that makes sense. seven, eight, nine, okay. Daniel receives revelation knowledge from the same source. The saint who is speaking to other saints about things that are going to happen on earth during tri tribulation. That's very good. It's better. better you're... So, wow. Because um, it also refers to um, the angel as being a man, too, here. Yeah. Right. Yes. So. The word man, though, is two words. I mean, you translated the same, the same thing, man. The word man pertaining to a human being is Adam. The word man pertaining to an angel, angels are called men, is ish. Ish. Ish, ish. are never referred to as Adam. Because they don't come from the human race. YHVH is referred to as ish. In Genesis 18, three men came to see Abraham. So angels are called men. Oh. But they when never you say call three men came to see Abraham, are you talking about the you talking about the, the visitation? When you say by his pen, you see three men coming. Genesis 18. Genesis 18. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, Laura. Let's see. Do you want me to add more? Yeah. Mm. Wow. One and two. Genesis turn Genesis eighteen okay. and one and two. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Special me. Okay. And the Lord appeared unto him in the pillars of Mamre, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So it is, the word here is ish. Angels are called men. Humans are called men. But humans come from the race of Adam. Adam. So they would never call an angel Adam. Now he, Abraham, understood that he, that he was being visited by white creation. He refers to him as Lord. Yes, he knew. Did he know at this point? Uh, he was an angel. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think he found that out after he was going to sacrifice his son. Oh, 